Here it is. Here's the original one. I think there's this misnomer that my orange coat is dead, but no, it's just dying quickly. There's just a good amount of this going on. But I think this thing has a couple more years for sure. So this is my desk. I sit here all day and I work and I look at this map whenever I'm daydreaming. I just look at this map. I bought this map off eBay and it was in like an elementary school and now it's in my office. I notice something every time I look at it that kind of irks me. That something is this. This zero. This zero, which is not just one number, but it's actually an, a corresponding line that looks like this. Let's back up here for a second. The Earth is divided into lines. <laughs> Sometimes they're curved like they are on my map and whether or not they're curved or straight has to do with this concept of projection Which is, I'm not going to talk about here. I've talked about plenty using a knife and a globe back in an old Vox video that I made But just know that the earth is divided up into lines latitude and longitude lines ones that go up and down and ones that go from side to side all of these lines in the grid have a number associated with them. So for the up and down lines, there's a zero point, and then anywhere to the right of that or east of that starts to go up from zero to 180 with a little E next to it for east of the zero line. And then everything to the left or the west of it has the same thing, zero to 180 with a W for west, okay? That center point is the zero point from which all east and west things are measured. The same thing for these side to side lines. If you go up from here, you're gonna start to get higher and higher until you get to 180 degrees north. Or if you go south, you will go 180 degrees south, which is the South Pole. Finding out where the zero point should be for these horizontal lines is actually quite easy. The Earth has these two natural poles, which make for a natural top and bottom of the Earth. And halfway in between those two poles, you have this perfect center point, the equator, which is a very natural place to put this zero point and to measure everything from. The up and down lines are totally arbitrary where you decide them. Like who's to say that like it couldn't be right here in Russia and this could be zero and everything could go west and east from here or Japan for that matter. Well, in fact, a long time ago, that's how it used to be. These maps with these grids were really, really important for navigating the world and so everyone had to choose a zero point. And most would just make their capital or their home base the zero point. If you lived in Japan, you would just make Japan the zero point and the rest of the coordinates would be measured against that one zero point, which was Japan. And same if you lived in France or Washington DC. This was fine because back then countries kind of just fought wars and competed with each other. They weren't really collaborating or aligning or trading as much as they do today. And so everyone could just have their own maps centered around their place and they did just fine. But then around the 1800s, a few things started to happen that completely changed everything. First, countries and empires, instead of just competing and fighting with each other, started to actually say like, we should align with each other and trade and be friends because that's better for everyone. Pair this with the fact that map making and sea navigation was becoming like a big industry. It was no longer just the king ordering maps to be made for their like expeditions, but now it was like private businesses going out and doing things that private businesses do. And so there was now like a demand for good seafaring maps. In short, map making was trending. Seems like a pretty good time to be alive. Okay, and there was one more thing that was happening around this time that was super important, which is this. Trains, trains everywhere. Trains were just like popping up everywhere and trains were also trending. People were now able to travel like across the country, not just like on their horses, but on this whole system of trains where you could buy a ticket, get on a train 
and end up somewhere hundreds of miles away. And you know what trains run on, besides coal, is time, timetables, schedules. How do you know when your train's gonna arrive and when it's gonna leave and when it's gonna get there? Time, some universal set time. The problem is, back in the 1800s, there was no universal set time. Check out this piece of paper. Today, all of these cities and towns would be just on Eastern Standard Time, one time zone. But back then, every town had their own time, depending on when it was noon for them. If they were a little bit east or a little bit west of here, that would be different than in Washington, D.C. Total nightmare for trains. The lifeblood of trains is time. And this time mishmash just wasn't going to work. Okay, so what does all of this have to do with this? Look at this guy. You probably don't know who this person is. I didn't know who this person was. He was the US president that no one remembers. This US president in the late 1800s saw a problem with all of this. He realized that having a bunch of different maps with a bunch of different zero points based on whoever was making it was a problem. And he realized that not having a universal time zone or some sort of universal way of making the same time for everyone was also a problem. So he invited 41 countries to come here to Washington DC where I live and to sit around and think and talk about where this zero point should be. Where should the center of the world be so that we can measure time as well as navigation. All maps could be normalized to this one spot. So after a moment of a bunch of white dudes sitting around in a room in Washington DC, which is kind of what's happening today in Washington DC, they came to a vote. And that vote, you almost unanimously, said that the zero line should be right here. This line, if you zoom in, goes right through London, England. It actually goes through a little outskirts town called Greenwich. Greenwich is the home of the Royal Observatory of the British Empire. This would be the place where the prime meridian or the zero point for the entire world, east and west, would start. Every country at the conference agreed that this should be the case, except for the Dominican Republic at that time called Santo Domingo. They said no, they were the one country that didn't like this proposal. And France and Brazil actually abstained diplomatically, which was kind of them saying like, oh, we don't agree with this. France continued to make their maps with Paris as the center point, but eventually they got on board as well. So that gets to the crux of my big question of why the zero right there, which is a bunch of people voted on it, but why were they so down with Britain having the zero point being in the center of the world? Well, the answer is because it was 1884 and Britain was just really good at the ocean. The British Empire was by far the biggest, most powerful navy. They had the most experience with maps and ocean faring. And so it was kind of a natural choice to let Britain, the king of the ocean, have this center point. And from then on, maps started to be drafted with Greenwich, this Royal Observatory, as the center point for the east-west divide in the world. Over time, this exact point, exactly where it's drawn, has shifted a tiny bit because of better tools to measure things, and so it's actually a, like not literally on the Royal Observatory anymore, but it's effectively in the same place that was drawn in this 1884 conference. But they also established that all time in the entire world would be measured against this same spot, Greenwich. Noon at Greenwich, at the Royal Observatory, would be the peg against which all other time was set. They called this Greenwich Mean Time. So you end up getting a map that looks like this. Zoom in and you see Greenwich is right here. That's GMT, Greenwich Mean Time, okay? You go west of here and you start to get GMT minus one or minus two, minus three. You can come all the way back to the east coast of the United States and this time zone is Greenwich Mean Time minus five right now. Sometimes it's minus four if there's daylight savings and daylight savings is dumb and whatever. But you get the idea. The more you go west, you go back from Greenwich Mean Time. If you go east, it's the opposite. You go forward to Greenwich Mean Time. So if it's noon at Greenwich, then this next time zone, it'll be 1 p.m. 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m., etc. So these time zones have been marked up in these kind of strange shapes. Eventually, if you go 12 steps away from Greenwich, 12 time zones, you'll end up here at this mess. This mess is the International Dateline. 
This is where Greenwich Mean Time plus 12 or minus 12 ends up at this line, which is where a new day starts. So let me give you an example of what this would look like. Imagine it's 4 p.m. in Greenwich, England, right here at this Royal Observatory. It is 4 p.m. GMT on May 28th. If anyone wants to send me a birthday gift, May 28th, <clears throat> May 28th. It's May 28th at 4 p.m. GMT, Greenwich Mean Time, sitting, chilling in the Royal Observatory, which I've never actually been to. I need to go to the Royal Observatory. I need to go to the Royal Observatory. I'm gonna do that this year, next year, at some point. Okay, so it's 4 p.m. May 28th. Across the ocean here in Washington, D.C. at that time, you can see that we go from 4 p.m. minus 5, so 11 a.m., okay? So it's 11 a.m. here in Washington, D.C. at that exact time on May 28th. Head across the United States to the west coast of the United States to Seattle or Portland, and right there it's three hours earlier than it is here. You're now at 8 a.m. So it's 8 a.m. here, it's still 4 p.m. in Greenwich. It's still 4 p.m. in London. Now you head into the Pacific Ocean, keep going west until you get to French Polynesia, at which time it's five in the morning. You're now GMT minus 11, it's five in the morning. And then you get right up to this messy line. If you were to be in the Baker Islands, which is like a US, like random uninhabited island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you would be at 4 a.m. So it's 4 p.m. over in Greenwich. It's 4 a.m. on this random island in the Pacific. So then cross this messy looking line. It's still 4 a.m., but now it's the next day. It's May 29th at 4 a.m. Here in Fiji, at the same time, 4 p.m. at Greenwich, it's now 4 a.m the next day, May 29th. So we went from being 12 hours behind Greenwich to being 12 hours in front of Greenwich just by going over this international dateline. You could do this exact same thing going the other way. Start heading east and you see that you now it's 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. Head all the way over into Asia and now you're getting closer to seeing how that 4 a.m. happens when you get over to Fiji. Now the caveat to all of this is, of course is that some of these countries switch by an hour for like daylight savings type things and whatever, but ignore that. Imagine there wasn't daylight savings. Right now in this moment where daylight savings is at least end in the United States, this holds across the whole world. Someday I'll make a video about this whole messy debacle. But the point of all of this is to say that because of this conference in 1884 to reconcile train timetables and to make maps more uniform, we now have this navigation and time system that rules our whole world. And Britain is just sitting at the center of it, of course. The British Empire may have fallen and the world has moved on from Britain being the center of the world in a lot of ways, but it's still technically the center of the world in a lot of ways. I'm gonna put some links in the description for some of these cool tools that kind of help visualize time zones if you're interested in that sort of thing. But yeah, my question has been answered. I actually didn't know the answer to this question and I went on a deep dive and now I know. So now I'll sit at my desk and I will know the answer to why that's zero and I think that was worth it. So thanks. Big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is this giant repository of online tutorials where you can subscribe and have unlimited access to tutorials about everything you can imagine from design to entrepreneurial skills to photography, videography, it's all there. I learned everything I know with online tools, including Skillshare, and I really believe in the model of online learning. There's one course in particular that I would recommend, which is this Premiere starting course. I remember the year I switched over to Premiere from Final Cut Pro to edit my videos. I knew a lot about the fundamentals of editing, but I found that going through a course that really lays out all of the features of Premiere and refreshes all of the kind of fundamentals of editing was really important. So even if you are like a, an editor who's experienced, I think there's great value in going through and getting a holistic view of what Premiere can do and some of the tricks and tips that maybe you didn't learn 
if you haven't done any sort of formal trainings. Because they sponsored this video, they're giving all of you two months free of unlimited access to all of these tutorials so you can try it out, see if it's a good fit for you. So click the link in the description to get those two months free, test it out, see if you like it. Thank you Skillshare for sponsoring and thank you all for watching. I will see you in another video sometime in the future. Thank you.